everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you might be. My name is Emilio Bruna uh, from the University of Florida and president of the ATBC. And I'm really excited here to be the moderator for today's lightning talks on the effects of anthropogenic disturbances on fauna. We have a great lineup of speakers. I'm going to run through them here today and then go through a little bit of logistics for those of you who are in attendance. Um, and then we'll get started with the presentations. Um, so our speakers uh, here in order today are, are Lucas Pavan from Stanford University in the United States, Cynthia Lorena Isla, uh, University of Brasilia, um, Iris Berger from uh, the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Um, I think Peter Williams uh, from the University of Montana um, is gonna be presenting today for, uh, for his uh, group of collaborators. Uh, Miyabi um, Nakabayashi from Hiroshima University in Japan, um, Ana Filipa Palmeirin from the University of East Anglia in the UK, Inzi Vanderhoek from the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund International in Rwanda, Mahipuri from the University of Florida in Gainesville, go Gators, um, um, Kirthik Rusa um, Sitharthaman from the University of British Columbia, um, Sean Hayton, uh, CNRS in Toulouse, France, um, and Siok Bin Kim from the University of Miami uh, here in the United States as well. Uh, thanks to all of you. Thank you very much for your contributions. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, to everybody in the audience, uh, please do submit questions for the speakers at any time you'd like during the presentation using the Zoom Q&A button. Of course, you've heard this now a couple of times already. Um, that way that uh, the questions will be addressed both in real time and at the end, we should have a little bit of time to address some questions as well. Um, after the session has ended, if you have questions for our speakers, please do go to the session page where you can post them um, using the question function on the on Whova for the session page. But during the presentations themselves, please do post them on the using the Zoom Q&A button. Um, and with that, uh, why don't we uh, take it away and watch some videos here. Thanks a lot, everybody. Hi everybody, my name is Lucas Pavan and I'm a PhD candidate at Stanford University. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on the lands of the Remitush and Moak Maloney in present-day California, as well as on the lands of the Badre, Bolu, Nzeme, and Baca of present-day Cameroon. I'm going to talk to you about my dissertation work concerning the cascading effects of hunting in Afrotropical rainforests. As I'm sure you all know, global biodiversity loss is progressing at a very high rate and is having a dramatic effect on larger body mammals. As large, as large species disappear and smaller species persist, what we are essentially seeing is a subsetting or downsizing of mammal assemblages. This disappearance can initiate the coextinction cascades of other non-mammalian wildlife such as birds. Understanding which bird species are most adversely affected by the loss of mammals can tell us a lot about how ecosystems will operate in an increasingly defaunated world. To study the effects of mammal loss on birds, we need to examine avian communities under different conditions of defaunation, where other confounding factors are held constant. Hunting is an effective way to do this. Because hunters prefer large species, hunting approximates the size-specific nature of global defaunation quite well. It also does not necessarily modify habitat and can vary in intensity within manageable spatial scales. This means we can compare bird communities in roughly identical forests, some of which are hunted and some of which are not. Given this approach, our study can be boiled down into two main questions. The first, does hunting pressure on mammals in actually influence the community composition of non-hunted birds? The second is basically, if so, how? Are there clearly defined winners and losers in bird communities under conditions of mammal defamation? To answer these questions, we conducted our study around the Jaw Faunal Reserve in Cameroon. This area is comprised of continuous primary rainforest, as you can see in the satellite map. Inside the reserve boundary, here in orange, hunting is illegal, while outside it is permitted. We established a 60, we established a 60 kilometer non-continuous transect running across the reserve boundary with half inside and half outside. We expected that this transect would occur within similar habitat, but that the two ends would experience different levels of hunting, or in other words, different levels of defaunation. 
We conducted vegetation surveys and installed camera traps every kilometer along this transect. We also collected evidence of hunting and sampled bird communities using mist nets in these three red focal areas here. The results of our vegetation and hunting surveys confirmed our suspicions that the transect occurred within similar habitat, but spanned dramatic differences in hunting optic. I won't show this here in the interest of time. What I will show are the results from our cameras. On the x-axis, we have the distance from the reserve boundary, inside on the left and outside on the right. Inside the reserve, we have quite high occurrences of large mammals, but these decrease rapidly as we move outside. When I say large mammal here, I mean anything bigger than a kilogram. Looking at the figure on the right, we can also see that the proportion of mammals captured by our cameras changed. Species smaller than a kilogram in blue came to dominate communities outside relative to species larger than a kilogram in orange. This indicates that we are seeing a downsizing effect here. So now that we know that the transect spans different conditions of mammal offtake, does this defaunation actually impact communities of non-hunted birds? On this PCA, each point is a sample from our mist nets, colored to correspond with which focal area they occurred within, or which defaunation treatment, low, intermediate, and high. These ellipsoid 95% confidence intervals indicate that the bird communities at the two ends of the transects are non-overlapping and statistically distinct. So, which bird species are common at low defaunation with more large mammals, the elephant, and which are common at high defaunation with more small mammals, the rodent? Because the communities parse along the first principal component, we can look at which bird species are most associated with the two ends of this axis here. In this figure, I have taken the x-axis and flipped it onto the y-axis. The rodent still denotes high defaunation sites and the elephant low defaunation sites. When looking at foraging guild, what we can see is that low defaunation bird communities have a lot of species that forage on the ground, while high defaunation bird communities shift upwards with more species that forage in the mid-story. If we do the same thing but with diet, we can see that granivores and insectivores tend to do well at low defaunation, while nectarivores and frugivores tend to do well at high defaunation. Taken together, this may suggest that ground foraging granivores and insectivores are the most vulnerable to mammal defaunation. So we can see that avian communities seem to respond to the removal of mammals along our transect of defaunation. We can also see that this pattern is characterized by winners and losers, with different species responding differently. The question then becomes, what does this mean for how ecosystems function? For example, will the loss of granivores influence patterns of seed dispersal and forest regeneration in the job? Addressing these unanswered questions will form the next step in our research, understanding the cascading effects of defaunation. With that, I'd like to thank you all for listening, and I'd like to thank these people without whom this work would not have been possible. I'll take, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. So hello everybody, good afternoon, I'm Cynthia, I'm a student of forest engineering at the University of Brasilia, and I'm here to present to you our work, the impact of mammal extinction on the frugivore plant at work on the Atlantic, of the Atlantic rainforest. And so first, tropical ecosystems cover a significant proportion of forest plant mass and provide vital services for the existence of life. Among the many existing tropical forests, the Atlantic rainforest is one of the most threatened biomes worldwide. The biome has been suffering severe pressures, especially after the colonization of Brazil in the 16th century and the exploration of the Pau Brasil tree. And nowadays, with large areas occupied by pasture and agriculture. Atlantic rainforest currently has less than 20% of its original cover left across small fragments. The interactions between plants and animals are essential for the Atlantic rainforest dynamics and succession. 89% of the wood plants in the Atlantic rainforest depend on animals to be dispersed, especially frugivorous mammals. However, close to 25% of all frugivorous mammals in the Atlantic rainforest are threatened with extinction due to fragmentation. Primates are the most threatened ones. One of, the, one of the matters of understanding the ecosystem dynamics and the role of different species in the ecosystem structure is through the analysis of network of interactions. These analyses use different metrics, such as between centrality and interaction similarity, in order to understand ecosystem dynamics. Between centrality evaluates how important a node is in connecting different models of interaction. Interaction similarity, as the name suggests, measure how similar different species are in terms of their realized interactions. In the study, we also evaluate the similarity of diets between mammalian species under different threat levels according to IUCN. 
Uh, so in this work, we aim to evaluate the role of threatened mammals species on the structure of the planet of the plant for Gibra network in the Atlantic rainforest and to evaluate the importance of threatened mammals and species for the ecosystem services provided by them in the Atlantic rainforest. Uh, to compile the interactions between frugivorous mammals and plants, we have used the Atlantic Frugivora data set, which is the largest compilation of tropical animal plant interactions in the world. After selecting all the interactions between frugivorous mammals and plants, we classify the animals according to their threat level category following the IUCN assessment. Uh, we have built our network metrics, considering for each cell value to be represented by the number of reported interactions between a mammal and a plant in our database. We evaluate the closeness and neutrality and between its neutrality in order to measure the importance of each mammal order, threat level, and population trends in the network of interactions. In order to measure the readiness in the interactions between frugivorous mammals with different threat levels, we evaluate the similarity through the bright curtis index. And we observed that higher levels of between centralities were observed between primates, which are also the most threat mammal order, and the species with decreasing population tendencies. Primates represent about 25% to 40% of herbivorous biomass in tropical forests, and the Atlantic rainforest contains a large number of primate species. This order is very sensitive to hunting and habitat loss, and its local extinction may affect all ecosystems functionally. After analyzing the interaction similarity, we have observed that there is a lack of dietary readiness between threat and least concerning species, which can cause a loss of interactions and ecosystem services in Atlantic rainforest after extinction of threatened species. Uh, so, with this work, we, we conclude that primates are very important for the network's structure in the Atlantic rainforest as model connectors. Lack of diet readiness between threatened and least concerning species can cause ecosystem services losses. And we recommend protection of threatened for diverse mammal species, in special primate species, restoration of degraded areas, control of illegal hunting and zoonosis outbreaks, preservation of species with decreasing population trends. Uh, ultimately, we would like to thank the institutions and research support funds that supported us throughout the development of this research. Hello, my name is Iris Berger. I am a PhD student at the University of Cambridge, studying how to reconcile agriculture with biodiversity conservation. However, today I would like to present the findings of my master's dissertation. Under the supervision of Professor Yedvinda Mali and Jesus Aguirre Guterres, I used a trait based approach to investigate whether deformation via the breakdown of sea dispersal networks could have led to changes in tropical forest composition and functioning over the long term. By altering animal plant interactions, deformation disrupts forest functions such as herbivory, pollination, sea predation, and sea dispersal. Sea dispersal is likely to be especially affected by deformation, given that around 80% of tropical forest woody plant species produce seeds that are dispersed by vertebrates. Deformation is also frequently site selective, with the removal of the larger species causing a downsizing within the fruitful community. Previous studies have usually either simulated the effects of a decline of large seeded animal dispersed tree species on tropical forest functioning or assess the effects of divination on seedling and suckling recruitment through real-world observations or exclusion experiments. However, it is important to gain an understanding of the long-term consequences of divination on ecosystem composition and functioning. Disruptions to the seed dispersal networks caused by divination may manifest themselves in shifts in the reproductive functional trait composition of plant communities. So here we investigated whether tree reproductive traits and community composition carry potential deformation signals across space and time. We obtained vegetation census data from 69 permanent vegetation plots in Ghana and Gabon. All vegetation plots were measured at least twice, which allowed us to estimate the age of each tree during the most recent census. And we then grouped the trees into different age classes or cohorts. We then compiled functional trait data for all the tree species from the literature. This then allowed us to ask whether age cohorts differ in the proportion of animal dispersed trees in each plot. 
we compiled functional trade data for all tree species from the literature. This then allowed us to ask whether age cohorts differ in the proportion of animal dispersed trees in each plot. And we expected younger cohorts to have a low proportion of animal dispersed trees due to a decline in the number of seed dispersing animals. We also asked whether the seed width of animal dispersed trees differs between age cohorts, expecting to find the average seed size to be lower in the younger age classes due to a disproportionate decline of megafauna and the functional role of dispersing large seeds. We analyzed the data using generalized linear mix models with plant identity as a random term and age cohort and country as fixed effects. We also fitted an interaction between cohort and country and included a variety of covariates such as precipitation and temperature. We then conducted model selection based on the Bayesian information criteria. The most parsimonious model suggested the proportion of animal dispersed trees differs between age classes, where there are relatively fewer animal dispersed trees in younger cohorts. Similarly, the average seed width of animal dispersed trees was lower in younger age classes, especially in trees that are less than 50 years old. Our findings show that in the tropical forests of Ghana and Gabon, changes in the prevalence of functional traits related to seed dispersal have occurred in a manner that would be expected under increased deformation pressure over time and a downsizing of faunal variables. Our work may contribute towards establishing baselines and setting biodiversity targets because our work provides a long-term perspective and an insight into the reproductive trade composition that can be expected when there's a relatively intact faunal community. My colleagues and I are currently assessing whether the observed trade changes are indeed likely to be a result of deformation or whether other factors such as succession could play a role. Thus, we're including species light tolerances and the age of the forests in the models, as well as the relative abundance of different frugivores taxa across time. We are currently also assessing whether there are any correlations between the reproductive functional traits and non-reproductive plant functional traits. So preliminary results suggest that animal dispersed tree species have a greater wood density than abiotically dispersed species. And the greater the seed size of the um, animal dispersed tree species, the greater is the wood density. So there are potentially far reaching consequences for ecosystem resilience with sort of negative feedback loops between deformation and climate change. And also considerations towards deformation must be given when drafting effective climate change mitigation strategies. So with this, I would like to thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. I'm Peter Williams, and I will be talking about how fungi and insects compensate for lost vertebrate seed predation in an experimentally defaunated tropical forest. Tropical forests are losing their large vertebrates due to overhunting. One consequence of this defaunation is that seed predation by large vertebrates will be reduced. And as these large seed predators are removed from forests, seed survival may increase. However, it's not just large vertebrates that kill seeds. So we also have lots of small vertebrates that kill seeds and insects and fungi. So if we remove these large vertebrates, then what will happen to seeds? We wanted to know, do other seed enemies compensate for reduced vertebrate seed predation? So to study this, we did an experiment here in Danum Valley, Saba, Malaysian Borneo. In this experiment, we set up uh, six treatments in a nested exclosure design where we excluded larger vertebrates with fencing, and then we excluded small vertebrates and sprayed insecticide or fungicide, or for one of our treatments, both. And this experimental design with these six treatments, we replicated at 10 blocks throughout the forest. At each of these blocks and at each of these treatments, we repeated this experiment for five species. So we have Democarpus longan, which is commercially grown as longan, um, but is also native to the forest where we worked. And these other four species are all members of Diptera carpaceae with non-fleshy wind dispersed fruits. So we monitor these seeds twice a week and measured how many seeds were killed by vertebrates, which we can see here in the lower left of one that was chewed up, how many seeds germinated. 
here with the radical emerging, and how many seeds established as seedlings here with the cotyledon unfurled. So what we found is that large vertebrates did kill seeds. So in our treatment where anything could eat it, about 25% of all seeds across species were killed by vertebrates. But when we excluded the large vertebrates, vertebrate predation went down or was eliminated, but overall seed survival didn't change. So excluding the large vertebrates didn't affect overall seed survival. And this is because insects and fungi compensated for reduced vertebrate seed predation. So we found that looking at our uh, five species overall, if we look at the germination stage and the establishment stage and compare a treatment that excluded all vertebrates but didn't have insecticide versus one that did have insecticide, um, we see that spraying insecticide did increase seed survival. And though, although we didn't see an effect for fungicide across all of our species combined, when we look at the species individually, two of the five species showed a strong fungicide effect where spraying fungicide increased seed survival. So we're seeing that insects and fungi are killing these seeds, which makes us think that the insects and fungi must be the things that are killing these seeds when vertebrate seed predation is reduced. So in conclusion, um, reduced vertebrate seed predation didn't change seed survival. And this shows that the impacts of defaunation on plants may be mediated by the rest of the community. So instead of just thinking about the vertebrates and seed survival, we see that these insects and fungi are also playing a role to ultimately affect tree population dynamics. And this is really interesting to think about given that not all seed predation is the same. We know that insects and fungi um, are more responsible for Jansen-Connell effects. And so this shift from vertebrate seed predation to non-vertebrate seed mortality could have implications for plant coexistence. So the last thing I wanna do is thank all of these people for the help and to thank you for watching. I am Miyabi Nakabayashi. I'd like to introduce my study briefly. About 20% of world mammal species face risk of extinction, and this rate is becoming rapid and worse. Especially, the status of mammals in Indo-Malayan region is the worst. This threat is mainly caused by anthropogenic factors such as hunting, habitat loss, and invasive species. Regardless of this issue, we still await effective and realistic solutions because of the paucity of basic ecological information of mammals. Knowledge of temporal activity patterns of animals is one of the most crucial information to propose proper conservation measures. Because some animals can change their temporal activity patterns by anthropogenic disturbance, Information on temporal activity patterns can be used to assess animal response toward the human activities. Studies using camera traps have become popular worldwide in including tropical regions. However, most studies are conducted in one study site during limited periods, usually less than two years, so more broad-scale and long-term studies are needed to avoid underestimation. We conducted this study in three protected areas in Sabah, Malaysian Borneo during this continuous period from 2010 to 2016 in order to evaluate effects of human disturbance on temporal activity patterns of animals. The three study sites have different sheets in the category and level of human disturbance as summarized in this table. We compared activity levels of species among the three study sites. Study species are four main hunting target ungulate, namely bearded pigs, barking deer, mouse deer, and samba deer. We also focused on two most common carnivores in the study sites, namely common palm civets and malay civets. 
We set cameras for more than two years at each study site. This slide indicates overlaps of activity patterns in each study site of the four angulates. Only Beradit peaks showed statistical differences in the activity levels by the study site. In TWR, they reduced the diurnal activity and increased nocturnal activity. The difference was not significant, but activity patterns of somebody in DVCA have similar tendency as Beradit peaks. This slide shows overlaps of activity patterns in each study site of the two shivets. There were no significant differences among the study site and both are nocturnal. Although differences were not significant, peak of the activity of common palm shivets was delayed and unclear during 7 to 9 pm in LKWS. Beradit peaks change their activity patterns in response to their predator, clouded leopards hunting patterns. However, clouded leopards are recorded in all the three study sites. In TWR, there were small residential areas, including workers in oil palm plantations. Therefore, bearded pigs might react to these human activities during daytime and increased nocturnality. Sambardia in DVCA tended to increase nocturnality. In DVCA, tourists do use the same trails during daytime where we set cameras. Therefore, they might avoid encountering humans. Common palm shivets are known to prefer riverine forest environment. In LKWS, there were spotlighting activities along the river every night during 7 to 9 p.m., so they might directly affect it by this activity and they reduced activity during this time. Thus, not only hunting but ecotourism may also affect some animals' activity patterns. We need to assess animal behavior regularly and should consider tourism time, areas, and frequency to reduce negative effect on animals. Thank you very much for your listening. Hello everyone, uh, I am Filippa Palmeri. I am currently based in Cebu in Portugal. And I am uh, delighted for being here today uh, to talk about my research on the effects of habitat loss and insular fragmentation as induced by a mega hydroelectric dam in uh, Brazilian Amazon on the assemblages of these two species groups, the small mammals and the lizards. Currently, habitat loss, fragmentation, and subsequent degradation are primary drivers of biodiversity loss worldwide. In the tropics, hydropower development is a major cause of this habitat loss and insular fragmentation by often creating vast insular landscapes in which forest islands are isolated within a hostile open water matrix. And uh, these are some examples of these landscapes. And across these fragmented landscapes, larger habitat fragments tend to harbor more complete species assemblages, eventually accumulating more species and more species traits and more phylogenetic lineages. And at the other extreme of the habitat fragmentation gradient, consisting of small habitat fragments, we expect to find only depauperate species assemblages, probably consisting of generalist species such as the heliophile lizards that use the direct sunlight to thermoregulate, or small mammals that can uh, move across the aquatic matrix, for example. So in this study, we analyzed the three dimensions of, div of diversity for small mammals and lizards, and then the, the response to of particular species traits. This study was carried out in the Balbina Hydroelectric Reservoir and its immediate surroundings located in central Brazilian Amazonia. Lizard assemblages and small mammals were surveyed across 25 
islands of different sizes and degrees of isolation and in four mainland continuous forest sites. Small mammals will survive using life in pitfall trapping and lizards will survive using pitfall trapping. We then considered a set of functional and ecological species traits to characterize small mammal and lizard assemblages. So for small mammals, we considered species body size, locomotion, habitat, trophic level and matrix tolerance. And for lizards, we considered species thermoregulation mode, so species could be either heliophile or heliophobic, the habitat type used, body length, range of prey size, and then we use the Simpson index to get the taxonomic diversity and the raw Q for the functional and phylogenetic diversity. And we also look at the community mean weights to characterize functional composition. As a result, uh, we obtained um, more than 800 uh, small mammals from 20 species and more than 1,000 lizards from 17 species. Functional and phylogenetic uh, diversities for both groups mirror the taxonomic dimension, all of which increasing with forest area in all instances. At the trait level, uh, I'm showing here just the traits for which we obtained a significant uh, response uh, with forest area. So for small mammals, overall body size increased with forest area and matrix tolerance decreased with forest area. For lizards, there was also a trend for, for body size to increase with forest area, but that was not linear. In terms of thermoregulation mode, heliophobes increased with forest area, whereas heliophiles decreased. In terms of habitat type, species using riparian habitats increased with forest area, whereas those using edges and clearings decreased. Um, many thanks to you all for listening, and I would like just very briefly to thank everyone who helped me collecting the data in for this study and the funding agencies in special the post-graduation program in ecology of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, CAPS and the European Commission. Thank you. Hi, my name is Inse van der Hoek. I'm a biodiversity researcher at the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. There are some places in the world, including the places where we work, where even the most basic understanding of species ecologies and natural history is still completely missing. The Democratic Republic of the Congo is one of these areas, an area arrived with security issues, logistical challenges, and just a very difficult place to do field work. Luckily, we have a tool in camera traps. Now, despite what all the special issues in camera traps and even like all the studies that you see on camera traps in Africa might suggest, is there is actually no coverage in Central Africa. Camera trap studies are still very rare, especially in the area of Eastern DRC, which is where we work in the Nkuba Conservation Area, a 1300 square kilometer primary rainforest that we protect in collaboration with the local communities in order to conserve and protect the Grouwers Gorilla, a critically endangered subspecies of the Eastern Gorilla. And it's also an area full of biodiversity and a lot of carbon storage. It's a very dense rainforest, so we started just to get an inventory. What kind of species do we have here? That's what we need to know in order to do effective conservation. So we went into the forest, set up camera traps in a grid-like pattern, collected over 16,000 days of camera trap data, which resulted in more or less 6,000 hours of camera trap events. In total, 29 mammal species, seven of which are globally threatened, and a lot of smaller stuff like sandies and squirrels and monitor lizards and bird species. Just to give you a few examples, we had honey badgers in groups even, African golden cat, a vulnerable species. Obviously, chimps and grouse gorillas are focal species, really. A lot of different ungulates, diker species, such as the yellowback diker, and imported seed dispersers in Red River Hawks. Now you can see from this last video, there's more information we can get than just the species. We can see who the living groups, are juveniles present. And from the time and hour stamp, we can kind of gather some information on their activity patterns. 
for example, here we plotted their core activity, which is the dark blue, uh, on the time of day. And we see that some species have two different periods when they're very active and a little pause in between. Maybe they are resting. Others are active throughout the day, they're cathemeral. Others have a peak at night. And if we just highlight a few species like the grouse gorillas, we know of the grouse gorillas that makes nests. We see that at 6, after 6 p.m., it's not active until early morning. The same for chimpanzees, completely diurnal, whereas a, a giant ground pangolin is completely nocturnal. We've not had one footage, one photo or video of it being active during the day. So in total, we can use these kind of data to classify the species we have. We have 12 diurnal species, some nocturnal species, etc. A lot of species that are corpuscular, so active at dusk or dawn, 10 at least. And a lot of them have like a bimodal pattern in activity. So they have two main or maybe more core periods of activity. And the question is why? We can use this for new hypotheses and new questions. For example, serverline genet is not active exactly when African golden cat is most active. Are they avoiding it? Is this a competition thing? Is it a predator-prey relationship that we're looking at? We can also gather ideas on energy expenditure, cathemeral species that are active during the day or throughout the whole day, obviously at the longest core activity period, so that goes for African golden cats and leopards, whereas an African brush-tailed porcupine is only active a few hours uh, in the middle of the night. I mentioned overlap between species, so if we look at competitors, species that share niches, species uh, that have predator-prey relationships, African golden cat and leopards seem to overlap very nicely in their activity throughout the day, so maybe they are spatially segregation, segregated in their niches. Something else, maybe they feed on different prey. Chimpanzees and gorillas have a very nice overlap as well, but some slight differences there where we see that chimpanzees are more active in the morning and gorillas a bit more in the afternoon. What did it show? It showed that the Incuba conservation area is a rich and diverse area full of mammals, a lot of globally threatened species. A camera trap set a baseline for understanding species ecologies, which sets the baseline for other studies on niche overlap, for example, seed dispersal, human wild conflicts, etc. This is a great study. We're still continuing it, and we can only do that with the help of all these people that work in the forest in Congo. So I really want to thank the whole field team and all our Congo staff and the people that have contributed to these studies, and especially the guardians of conservation, the stewards of these forests, the people of the village of Nkuba. Hi everyone. Ecosystems worldwide are being transformed dramatically for human sustenance with croplands and pastures covering nearly 40% of land area. Habitat loss and fragmentation due to land use change has amplified the pace of species extinction. Ambitious targets for protection of habitats are being set and this new decade has been declared as the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. In production landscapes, sustaining biodiversity, agricultural productivity and rural livelihoods is complex but possible. Land use systems such as agroforestry have shown success in providing ecosystem services and diversifying agricultural incomes. Spatial prioritization tools which inform optimum decision making typically rely on ecological data and associated costs. However, integrating social data can allow for selection of sites which are not only ecologically suitable and economically viable, but also socially acceptable. Carnivores play an important role in ecosystem processes, generate funding and intersect with human cultures. They are also extremely vulnerable to habitat loss and fragmentation. 23% of global carnivore species are found in India, making it one of the most important range countries. Although about 20% of the country is forested, less than 5% is included in the protected area network. The PAs are small, fragmented and under severe development pressure. My objective was to prioritize private lands where restoration could be implemented. For this, I combined spatial data on carnivore habitat use, farmers' willingness to engage in conservation stewardship, and project implementation cost. I conducted the study in the buffer of Pench Tiger Reserve located in central India. The dark green area is free of any human activities. 
Tench is recognized for harboring some of the highest densities of carnivores, supported by a diverse assemblage of prey. It is uh, located right at the center of a landscape comprising 16 protected areas and 35 corridors. While the core area of the reserve is inviolate, the buffer area is a heterogeneous landscape with multi-use forests and 55,000 acres of private agricultural land. I first used an occupancy modeling approach to estimate and map the probabilities of habitat use for four carnivores, tigers, leopards, wild dogs, and sloth bears using camera trap data. These results were used as the ecological data for the prioritization analysis. Next, I used a choice experiment approach to examine the willingness of landowners to enroll in a voluntary incentive-based agroforestry program. These probabilities were used as the social cost in the prioritization analysis. I combined this with the annual cost of program implementation set at $25,000 plus an incentive amount of $900 per acre per year to be paid to farmers. I used a program called Marksand for prioritization. The objective was to minimize the cost and boundary length of the overall prioritized system by ensuring compactness and proximity to existing forests while meeting the conservation targets. For a 10% conservation target and a scenario where I used only the ecological data, the analysis selected areas with the highest habitat use probabilities of the focal species, and it was highly concentrated in specific regions. The scenario in, uh, which ignores compactness results in a configuration which is the least costly but widely dispersed across the study area. The optimal scenario produced a configuration which balanced species occurrence, landowner willingness and compactness of the system. The cost of the optimal solution was 14% less expensive than the scenario which used only ecological data. I further categorized the prioritized areas based on their biodiversity value versus social economic cost. Implementing agencies can use such a categorization scheme to focus on the most important areas for intervention first. To conclude, several global assessments identify India as a priority landscape for restoration and carnivore conservation. But these studies are based only on global ecological data sets and completely ignore the ground realities of a developing country. Even within India, there are almost no fine scale assessments that integrate biodiversity and socioeconomic data. Integrated approaches result in cost effective solutions and an opportunity to triage interventions. With this, I would like to thank all my funding agencies and collaborators in the study. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kirti, Kirti Krita Sita Raman, and I wanted to understand the habitat preferences of vertebrates living in a landscape made up of forest fragments. So, with the guidance of Dr. Diane Srivastava, I went to Guanacaste province in Northwest Costa Rica, where its wet forests exist today as discontinuous forest remnants with human areas, agricultural areas especially, dominating the intervening matrix. I chose this area because its vertebrate community had not been documented using camera traps and nor were its habitat preference understood in detail. Diane and I thought that doing such a study in a regional level will also aid in making better land use decisions, which will address the needs of both wildlife conservation and agriculture. So, we hypothesized that measures of connectivity will affect the persistence of the meta community by affecting the dispersal of certain vertebrate species. We also hypothesized that species in higher trophic levels and threatened species will prefer large continuous forests or forest remnants surrounded by a lot of forest in their vicinity. We tested these hypotheses by sampling for mammals and larger bodied birds in 19 forest remnants using stratified random sampling in a mul for multiple seasons. And after sampling for 5,053 camera trap nights, we recorded 46 species and derived 13 response variables. To act as the habitat characteristics of predictors, we measured 12 variables at three scales of the habitat. We plugged this into an AICC-based framework 
and found the trophic functions were affected by landscape at the landscape scale with tree plantations having higher amounts or supporting areas with more amount of omnivores and carnivores orange plantations dominated our study area and perhaps they acted as the resource base for the omnivores which in turn acted as the prey base for the carnivores resulting in these results we also found carnivores to be carnivores like jaguars pumas jaguarundis and ocelots to be in higher numbers in areas with with more amount of forest in a 2 km radius correlating with the fact that these are animals with large home ranges and threatened species um oh i'm sorry and that tree plantations also supported forests with more amounts of species and thus forest remnants when surrounded by tree plantations tended to have higher amounts of uh, species and that threatened species like the beige tapir white lip peccaries and curassows tended to prefer large continuous forest we also found that encounters of different vertebrate groups to uh, be affected at the landscape scale with higher encounters in forests surrounded by tree plantations interestingly our results also found that birds like curassows guans and tinamous to be higher in large continuous forest and showed a preference for forest remnants which had more amount of forest in a shorter radius because they were also short probably because these are also short flight birds thus our study suggests that in order to understand the effect of habitat modification only using species richness as a biodiversity metric is insufficient our study also suggests that tree plantations can support higher species richness and that threatened species like the beige tapir thus require large continuous forests so for the future we suggest that studies be undertaken in the matrix habitats especially in the plantations then we also suggest that the effects of anthropogenic factors be tested on the vertebrate community uh, other anthropogenic factors and that species specific monitoring programs be initiated with that i wish to express my gratitude to dr dayan shrivastava for this opportunity to drs jill jankowski and cole burton for their support and guidance throughout the study to the ministry of environment and energy of costa rica to deloro private limited novel teak for the permissions to conduct the study to the rios moraga family my friends and my family for all the support that they provided during the field work and to atbc for this opportunity to share some of my understanding on some mammals and birds in the tropics thank you Good day ladies and gentlemen. Today I'll be speaking to you about a multidisciplinary view on pangolins. As we all know, pangolins have become these sort of conservation iconic species, and this is due to mainly two reasons. They were firstly implicated in COVID-19 as intermediate hosts for, to the pandemic, which has thus not yet been found to be true. Um they're also really well known in the illegal wildlife trade as the most trafficked mammal in the world. This is mainly due to the traditional Chinese medicine or TCM. um however they also used in things such as uh, important delicacies in various cultures what are pangolins exactly well they're a group of mammifugous mammals consisting of about 8 species uh and they're distributed between asia and africa despite their celebrity status and large distribution there's actually limited in knowledge on pangolins furthermore there's also limited effort in trying to amalgamate and review what is actually known about pangolins And in order to produce holistic guidelines of pangolins we need to not only amalgamate this data but also amalgamate it from various aspects of conservation. And so this is what we try to do, to do in our first multidisciplinary review and whereby we produce these sort of holistic research and conservation guidelines. I invite you to read the publication that has been published um as I'm not going to go into the details of the methodology. However, I'll just quickly give you a brief overview. basically we took data from uh, research databases popularization databases and commercialization databases in terms of patents and then amalgamated this so what did we find this here is a heat map um on the bottom is the different species and then on the top is their literature count raw literature count uh then we get on the left there we have the theme um and each theme has sort of subcategories or categories uh so for example conservation which is green then relates to all the different categories in green there. So what did we find exactly? We found that 
high count research areas require direction in species and in populations. We found that there's an inequality in conservation research. For example, we have high levels of volume and nature of trade papers, however, very limited literature on implications of this trade to these actual populations. We found that there's major knowledge gaps in contextually important uh, aspects such as immunology or education. And then we found major species biases, not only in raw article count, but also if you include the factor of size of their distribution, uh, whereby African species are just less represented. Uh, this is also the case for the African continent as a whole compared to Asia, as well as just the range states as well. As for popularization, we made some updates on the major causes of peaks of interest for pangolins. Uh, we found that as before, fun and interactive, or on the other scale, shocking, can cause the largest peaks of interest. Um, for pangolins, the largest peak was actually the intermediate host uh, implication uh, of COVID-19. If you consider pangolins with elephants or lions in terms of conic species, they're not yet the icons we'd hoped they would be, not only in just in terms of news article count, which is the solid lines, but also in terms of Wikipedia page views, which are the dotted lines. However, you can see that with COVID-19, which is the, the yellow arrow on the right there, this sort of dynamic is starting to shift, uh, whether or not this will cause sort of a vermin-like persona for pangolins, or was actually good publicity, we're not yet sure, and this is something we need to find out. In terms of commercialization, the traditional Chinese medicine was the main contributor to patents. However, we saw that there was seemingly no connection between biomedical research and patents, which then questions the efficacy and danger of using these medicines without scientific evidence. Also, we found seemingly no connection between patents and the traditional Chinese medicine pharmacopoeia, which are basically recipe books used by practitioners to, to look for cures. Um, there was quite a big dis disconnect, for example, promote lactation in pharmacopoeia, but cure cancer and AIDS in patents. This questions what is driving patents? Is it profit or something else? Are patents making their way to production and is there a link between these patents and the legal trade which could be important for monitoring we need more in-depth analysis in conclusion we have still a long way to go for pangolin conservation however we hope that this multidisciplinary review will help direct future research as we provide a database of publications since 1865 with tags by species locality and even topic we also produce a set of holistic guidelines in which we suggest important avenues for research and popularization we also also provide conservation actions not yet mentioned in current IC and action plans. This includes financial crime monitoring, orders of breeding farms and stockpiles, or even plan stakeholder working groups where we can generate knowledge as well as standard operating procedures for topics not well versed in, in, in literature such as rehabilitation, education, tourism, veterinary procedures, so on and so forth. I thank you for your time. Hello everyone, my name is Sokman Kim. I'm currently a PhD student with Dr. Mauro Galetti at the University of Miami. Thank you for coming to my talk. Today, I'll be discussing forest elephant movement and how it is affected by topography. Movement of animals, which is often obtained from satellite and GPS telemetry data, can provide us with many insights. First, it can tell you where the animal has been, but it can also provide insights into an animal's behavior by calculating the directional persistence and how fast an animal has moved. This can be done down, broken down into encamped, slower and less directional or zigzagging, and exploratory, faster and more directional, or going straight. By overlaying such information with environmental variables, we can then start to discuss how certain environmental factors influence an animal's movement and potential behavioral states. The environmental variable that I was interested in was topography. As steeper terrain would likely inhibit a terrestrial animal's movement, topography is likely to influence the speed and turning angles at which these animals move. Despite the potential importance of this, some movement models have not included topography or quantified how topography would affect the movement and behavior of large terrestrial animals such as the forest elephant. To address such gaps in knowledge, I work with Dr. John Polson and Dr. Chris Barron from Duke University and obtained telemetry data on 74 GPS collar forest elephants from Gabon, Central Africa. I then overlaid these data with topography and other known important environmental variables on forest elephant movements such as precipitation, time of day, and sex to determine the relative importance of topography of movement 
and behavior. I used the Bayesian framework that was developed by McClintock and Michelot to the momentum package. This R package statistically assigns behavioral states in camped or exploratory through an assessment of all step length or the distance between every consecutive telemetry points and the turning angle or the angle formed between consecutive telemetry points. This package also allows for environmental layers, for example, topography, to be overlaid with movement data to determine how this variable affects movement, turning angle, and behavior. Through this method, I found that topography significantly affected movement speed and turning angles for forest elephants. As you can see from these figures, both turning angles and movement speed decreased between flatter topography and steeper topography. This effect was particularly great during the exploratory state, where its effect was greater in magnitude than all the variables examined. During this exploratory state, movement speed decreased by 1.6 meters per hour per degree slope, and turning angles decreased by 0.5 radians per degree slope. Meanwhile, we found that these characteristics did not differ greatly between males and females. Our model also found out that the encamped state was more common during steeper topography and provided maps like the one on the right, which details the movement state of each individual in the context of topography. So overall, we found out that the topography had a clear effect on forest elephant movement and behavior, and this effect was greater than that of other environmental variables that we examined. This study was the first to quantify the effects of topography on movement. This information can help us better understand how forest elephants use certain spaces and could help better inform conservation and management of the threatened and ecologically important species. Thank you so much for coming to this talk and please let me know if you have any questions. Well, thank you all. That that was just fantastic. Um, and it was really exciting to see a lot of back and forth in the Q&A, um, lots of questions being answered there. So if you haven't had a chance to see those, please do pop over to the Q&A because um, there are plenty of questions there. We may come back to some of them. Um, but in the, let me see here, a couple of minutes, well, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I've got a couple of other questions which came across in other ways. And so I was hoping I might ask some of those the speakers here. Lucas, you're still here, right? So yes, um, I've got a question here that was actually posted on the Hoover page, but I'm going to go ahead and pull it now um, just to see if we can get an answer for it. Um, it starts with a compliment. Great talk. I think we all agree. Um, how are you parsing out the impacts of hunting on birds and whether this is associated with mammal hunting? And which guilds might be more at risk of hunting, like snaring ground birds while hunting mammals, that kind of thing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so first thing, I guess, is just anecdotally, based on time spent in communities around the jaw, is that uh, bird hunting is very, very low um, across the board compared to all sorts of mammal offtake. Um, but secondly, uh, along with that, is the way that we're sampling bird communities is primarily using mist nets. Um, and so we're primarily catching passerns, which the hunting pressure on passerns is virtually zero in the system. And we wouldn't be sampling um, bird species that would potentially be hunted like ground birds. Um, so that's kind of one way where, how we're isolating non-hunted birds. Excellent, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, we'll come back because people had a bunch of questions um, for your talk too. So we'll see if we can get to some of those. Um, uh, let me see, my next uh, question here on my list um, is, give me, give me two seconds, let me make sure I've got it right. Uh, it hasn't been answered yet. No, 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 no. Uh, so my next question here would be um, for you, Kirthi. And so the question here is that uh, the, the result that orange plantations are a resource base for omnivores is is really, really interesting. The question is, is it is there the potential then for these um, orange plantations, which serve as resource bases for omnivores to then draw in predators like some of those bigger carnivores and in the end lead to potential conflicts 
and encounters with humans as well? Um, our results seem to be supporting that because we did find a positive effect from the um, positive effect on um, carnivores and animals in higher trophic levels also in terms of orange plantations. Um, but what we lack data right now is information right from the orange plantations. So I, I think there is a possibility of that happening. But these orange plantations and fragments have been in like in this kind of a place since 1997. I mean, these plantations are been in this area since 1997. So I think that given it's almost um, like 20 odd years that these plantations have been here and no conflicts have you know, surfaced. If they're going to be left in this sort of a situation, then probably this is the scenario that will con continue for the years to come. But if there is the forest area that's going to be more expanded and if the carnivores are more supported and stuff, then there can be some increase in conflict there po potentially. That's that's what I think can happen. So it's at least something to be aware of, I think is, you know, something yeah. to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think also like for the future, we socioeconomic surveys need to be done in that area to understand what is the current scenario of conflict. Because my knowledge is also coming from just, it's not coming from really structured social interviews. It's mostly from informal interactions. Which, you know, um, fits in nicely with the very first opening session we had this morning, kind of about the, you know, importance about the, the different perspectives and then fitting together. So I think that was great. Um, let me pull up my questions here again. So I have a question here um, for Sean. Sean, this is actually my question. So I'm going to take the prerogative of jumping ahead of the, the line since I'm the one holding the microphone. And this is going to be a really weird question, but bear with me. Okay. So I, I really like that. Um, one of the things I really liked about your talk is this idea about um, popularization and publicity and using these kinds of um, search techniques to look at um, perceptions of animals and things like social media. And I was really struck by a phrase that, um, that you used that you said you were disappointed that they weren't icons like elephants that were maybe becoming vermin like because of COVID. Now, I don't know anybody who looks at a pangolin and thinks, oh, it's basically a roach. Like everyone loved, like people love pangolins, right? Um, and the idea that if something, I mean, this is an unusual situation perhaps, but I think the, the notion that um, there are animals that have a PR problem. Isn't that weird to conservation biologists, right? Everybody who works on bats at one point has to try to convince people that bats are cool, that no, they're really important. They probably know exactly how many insects they eat, you know, in a night so that they can repeat that to people and all that stuff. But your work really made me think about this. Should we be thinking about preemptive publicity campaigns for animals that are of species concerns, but that humans might feel ambivalent about. Um, if, if the conservation issue that, that um, or the direction that conservation actions are going to go depends in part on how people feel about these animals, could we maybe prime people to feel good about them with, with preemptive positive campaigns? I mean, should we have cute, you know, memes about species that's potentially at risk X all over Twitter or Instagram or TikTok or whatever, or name a cryptocurrency after them, I don't know, whatever, just to kind of set the stage for future conservation action? That's a good question. Uh, I think there's there's two sides of the sword. Uh, if you make them too cute, then they become part of the pet trade. And I've uh, seen this if, with some, some really uh, important species. Um, I think the most important thing is for people to know about these animals and then they can decide for themselves whether or not they are cute or not. But um, it's definitely something that I think conservation organizations and conservationists and researchers should work toward is trying to actually get their species name out there, you know. Um, it's really important, uh, especially for most of the viewers around the world will be on Facebook or on uh, any sort of social media, um, not on, on sort of scientific papers or at the ATPC conference. So, it's important, you know, to, to, to push these, the, these narratives across these, these platforms, definitely. Um, for bank, uh, Yeah, that, that's really interesting. And of course, that, I hadn't even thought about the walking the fine line between a, a favorable image, um, but then the image that makes it be something that people want to buy as a status symbol or have, you know, carry around with them or, or worse. So that, that's really useful. Um, Anna, um, another question here that's come for you is, uh, congratulations, fantastic study. Um, 
very powerful. Uh, one of the questions that uh, comes up when seeing these um, great studies of oceanic um, or other forms of islands, insular, you know, um, islands or islands and dam systems, um, is how similar would you expect the results to be in terrestrial habitat fragments? And um, would you be willing to speculate about how they might be different, um, you know, if instead of being in a place like Bambina or Lagoguri or someone like that, it was instead um, terrestrial forest fragments? Uh, thank you. So um, what would ha will happen is that the area effects would not be so important. And uh, for example, in terms of species area relationship, the, the slope of the relationship would be much flatter. And uh, so we would not expect such drastic responses and the effects would not be so detrimental as well because we also have the terrestrial, some species can use and even sometimes take advantage of the terrestrial matrix. So sometimes what happens in the terrestrial fragments, not the insular ones, uh, is that you have some species from uh, open areas, for example, that are in the matrix and they start entering the fragments. And so it, it's quite different, yeah. Excellent, thank you. And, and I'm gonna give the last word here to um, Iris here, and it was a question that was asked earlier on and answered in the chat, but there were some people that came in afterwards and I thought it was, you know, an important technical issue that other, that other people, another question people might have, and that was, how did you determine age? Iris is off, maybe she might have gone to get a tea, um, so I was going to actually channel the answer and, and give it myself. Um, but instead, we'll just post it on the chat because I want to make sure that if we uh, that we don't run out of time here, we have about a minute left. So if anybody would like to post something here, I'm looking to see if there are any other questions online. There's nothing but compliments, which is um, not unusual, but it is always gratifying to see um, people complimenting you all on your presentations. And so with that, the questions I have here are for some of the um, other speakers who had to leave a little bit early. So we'll post those on the Whova page for those of you who asked them, make sure to go to the conference, to the, um, to the session page on the Whova platform for the meeting. And we'll have some of these questions posted there. And hopefully our authors will have a couple of minutes maybe to go and respond to them. With that, I wanna thank you again all for your outstanding presentations and um, especially a, you know, the unusual circumstances under which you had to give them. I'm always impressed um, by the quality of people's science in their talks and, and their presentations under challenging circumstances. You're all stars, really. Hats off to all of you. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Big round of applause for all of you. I'm not going to clap because I still have my mic open, but um, way to go. And uh, we'll see you all around. Head off to the next session, y'all, after a break. Bye-bye. <laughs>